Yo, what is up everyone? It's your uh, person, Yves St. Clair here. I'm with the wonderful Amar. I, I'm sorry, I forgot your last name at the very last It's, it's Vayani, no worries. Vayani, I wrote it down. <laughs> I'm sad that I, I even saved my like background photos like, oh, Amar Vayani. And then... <laughs> totally nah, it's all good in, uh, it's all good yeah but yes the one and only yeah i i, I mean amari is such a great name in itself like that's always what sticks out to me i guess <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for having me use of course of course so yes amar is here and he is a uh, i'm assuming he him pronouns just want to make sure yes yes okay. um is here to talk about a lot of different things he's a uh, would you call yourself a concert producer or like a someone who makes like bands uh, come together and play shows or yeah you could say that like a an organizer slash booker <laughs> slash uh scene figurehead i guess like mm. someone who's active in the scene i guess like a community in davis community mm. member yeah something oh, like yeah. along those lines oh yeah and then also just like techno Music, general. I would say you're probably just well versed in music overall, but like mm-hmm. when I think it's about kind of the kind of the that's the, kind of the product of just being at the radio station for so long. If yeah, um, sure. some of the listeners may not know, I'm assistant general manager at KDBS, which is in Davis, mm. um, which is actually how me and Eve's met a long time ago. We were yeah. recording, oh we were recording a noise band actually from <laughs> San Francisco called uh, what's their name? Well, it was a noise band, right? Yeah, no, 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 definitely. Um, collision Stories. Stories. Collusion Stories. Yeah, San yeah, Francisco yeah, Noise yeah. Band. There it is. <laughs> that interview was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I barely had known him. I still don't know a lot about noise, but like then like I just heard that noise existed. So I was just like, yeah, man, I've heard of Mersbo. <laughs> 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 and they were like, yeah, yeah. everybody knows Mersbo. Yeah, and um, they were like on some next level shit, like yeah. making noise out of rulers and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no worries, but, but yeah, um, and I think he even talked about one of them talked like they were from Germany or some like European mm-hmm. country, and they were doing marble mm-hmm. recordings or something, <laughs> just like the slicing marble. Yeah, yeah that was that was definitely one of the best sessions I've done. But I was sad that it, there was no video to show people how mm-hmm. the sounds were being made. I think yeah, you I had a camera out. a little bit. I remember it. that. Yeah, you had a camera out, and you were like, oh, "I need to get some of this on video before I go." <laughs> Oh my god. Dude, how old? I was like probably like 20 or something. 21. That was 2017 actually. Yeah. Oh, a long time. Almost yeah. three years ago. <laughs> three years ago. Oh my god. I was a child. A yeah. baby. Crazy <laughs> to think. Um, dang. I, yeah. Those are those are good times back in the studio. Just those random. I, you invited me to come on the, your, one of your shows and I always wished mm-hmm. I had. But yeah, like, yeah, it yeah. never happened because life gets busy. But dang. Yeah. Good show. That that is how I know Amar. If everybody uh, who's curious, um, so this guy is a legend as far as I'm concerned. Just an outstanding music community citizen. Is that like a, a Fair, like that title? Music community citizen. I'll take that. <laughs> a citizen. I don't know. Um, but yeah. Uh, so talk to me. Like what what is going on right now with music and techno specifically? Like. Are you noticing any major shifts in the scene? Um, definitely coronavirus had a big part playing it with everyone. Um, I guess a lot of DJs and a lot of people are now finding ways to reinvent themselves to like find themselves in an online space. Like, you know, where do they fit in? How can they best generate revenue for themselves? Because the whole club scene has taken a downfall, obviously, because of mm. social distancing. So we have... Totally. Um, you know, like a lot of people's main source of income was from touring. Like you don't, as a producer, usually you don't make your money off selling tracks. You make it off your shows. So yeah. same thing with the band, actually. Like, I feel like they make more money on the road than they would off Bandcamp, for example, right? Oh, um, for sure. So with that whole downturn, a lot of people are like moving on to sites like live streaming and you can mm. start a Patreon alongside, you know? So if people like what you're doing, they can support you monthly with a Patreon or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess it's, it's interesting because people are definitely reinventing the wheel as to how they can make a living off music mm. and how they can make a living off DJing, which is super interesting to think because it was pretty predefined as well, like before. Like you make tracks in the studio, then you go out and play those tracks live, and that's how you earn your money, you get your yeah. bookings, you know, the whole ordeal. But now 
you're almost like a master of your own booking because mm. you can go live whenever you wanna and go live for 24 hours if you want. If people like it, they'll you know, yeah. support you and stuff. So um, it's interesting how that's happened. And then with the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement, there's been, you know, or I guess a recentering on the focus of where the roots of house mm. and techno are. Um, because especially in the US, not so much in Europe, I'd say, but in the US, people forget that House of Detecto started in Chicago and Detroit yeah. and then was blown up by New York and then exported crossover to the UK and Europe and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's almost like as if Americans deny the history of techno and that may have something to do with, you know, systemic racism, some things to do with like lines of oppression, something along those oh. lines, which is really like, you know, as people who are involved in this music, it's really important to A, learn about the history and B, find out how we can unlearn some of the practices that, you know, that have been in place to shun these people from music that they've created. Mm -hmm. So really? I think that that's kind of like what the movement is, is kind of doing right now. It's like, you know, kind of recentering, think, taking mm -hmm. time to like think and like, you know, reestablish ways that they can support underground black folk, um, black LG, LGBTQIA plus folk, you know, everyone who's been marginalized by this, system that kind of only upholds like white Europeans as like the the face of techno or in the US, you know, white Americans as the face of techno with those big festivals like EDC and all that mm. like money making like <laughs> organizations and stuff. Uh which I could go I could go on about <laughs> for days about that stuff. But yeah. <laughs> I I mean, real quick on the debate, I'm assuming you're you're anti the term EDC, like you're not a fan uh, of that terminology. So yeah, like uh, I guess EDC is is short for Electric Daisy Carnival, which is the big festival that mm -hmm. kind of promotes EDM as the initialism for. Oh wait, yeah, like a, EDM. That's the phrase. Yeah. I'm thinking not EDC, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured from what you were hinting <laughs> at there, but uh, yeah, EDM being like this umbrella term for electronic dance music, um, as as a term in itself, it's just something that journalists and media writers like to give music. For example, when I was growing up. My brother would listen to electronic music. He used to go to raves in the UK and stuff, and he would call it club music. Mm. So it was just called club music. And before that, in the 90s, it was called dance music, or it was called techno. Techno as a broad generalized term for everything. So over time, we've seen like this word for electronic dance music change over time. Mm -hmm. But in the 2010s, we saw this like boom of the word EDM and it's like everywhere, like all these kids and all these ravers are like, yeah, we love EDM. And mm. like, it's it's important to think about where that came from because people in the UK still don't use that term. People in Europe sure, don't yeah. use that term. And they will usually just say electronic music or they'll specifically talk about what genre they like. Um, whereas in the US, it seems very industry driven, that term, because it's so easy and it rolls off the tongue very well, EDM. And it's mm. so apparent that a lot of sponsorships that sponsor events like EDC have been pushing that term on people so it's easy and it rolls off the tongue and it's like a group name for all of this music together that is being played at these big festivals mm -hmm. which is kind of what I use the word EDM for so when someone mm -hmm. asks me like hey do you like EDM I'll usually say do I listen I'll think in my head do I listen to the stuff being played at Electric Daisy Carnival and all these other like big American festivals and the answer is no because mm. that's just not what I'm about or not what I'm interested in exactly. Yeah. Um, the whole carnival scene is like kind of predicated on the fact that it's a money-making organization or making money off kids, for example. Like mm. if you if you go to one of these these shows, you're given free monster energy rather than free water. So like that's just like the biggest form of like you know commercialization of the whole scene like you know like Monster is sponsoring this event giving people free energy drinks and that just shows like how much like industry backing the movement has of EDM and that's kind of why you see news feeds and your social media populated with this term EDM and it's actually been done by the American rave industry to rebrand the culture for kids to get into it because we saw a big boom in 2010. Like as soon as like, mm -hmm. I think even in pop music, you saw like Lady Gaga, Katy Perry moving into like using using electronic music and themes mm -hmm. of that music. And that brought it back because in the 90s, you had Madonna who was ripping off black people making stuff like Vogue. Mm. So now we have Katy Perry and all these people making that popular again. With coinciding with that, we had 
the American rave industry being like, hey, we have an opportunity here. We had artists like David Guetta, Calvin mm. Harris, <laughs> all these guys who were super big in 2010. They made so much money off this music, off that term EDM, just because mm-hmm. that's how they got bookings. Top EDM charts, top EDM this. Mm. But for me, it's like almost a disservice. I'm a, I'm a really big genre purist. I love reading about genres. I love understanding why a genre is what it is. And I think it's a real mm. disservice to a genre to call it something it's not. I think we've even talked about random stuff like shoegaze versus dream pop in the past, right? Yes. And I remember having this conversation with you. And yeah, like, you called me out. I was like, ah, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, I, and I don't mean it in a pretentious way because I think in a way, if you take a genre and call it something it's not, you're ignoring all the struggles that that genre and that community had to do to get where it is today. Mm. Not so much in the case of shoegaze because that's more like a, a, a like a a media term that they gave it to people who were staring at their feet. But mm. for example, grime versus rap, you know, the struggles of the two are very different and the way that they came to prominence are very different, for example. And I think understanding those differences helps solidify a genre's role in the grand scheme of music. Mm. And that's just my opinion and you're free to disagree with me or like, no, you know, no, some, people, some, people, some people say stuff like, you know, like, oh, well, genres are stupid and they don't mean anything. And mm. I can see where they're coming from because I think of music as like, you know, an art space and all that. But I'm like, you know, that's not really how it works. People use genre tags, especially now on social media, to find new music, right? Like you go on Spotify, yeah. you go on like this chart, this chart, or some someone makes a play the same house 101 or something. And then you're mm. more likely to check it out because you're looking for a specific sound. Oh, absolutely. If, you, if there was no genre, then how would you find the sounds you're looking for? It just seems kind of exactly. counterintuitive for me. Especially in techno, I feel like, like that. I don't think I would ever like look up like rock music anymore, like to find yeah. new rock music. But like, right? Techno, it's like there's some dude <laughs> cranking out a track constantly, so you just can find <laughs> some like random banger, like yeah. And then they'll that'll be their song, and maybe they have a couple other songs max. But usually, most mm-hmm. people I think just have one hit in techno. Is, is that? Would you say that's an accurate thing to say? I think I think so in terms of like big time blowing up, like a million views, million plays, definitely. Mm-hmm. You usually only have like one or two breakout tracks unless you're like a big pioneer of the track and every single one of your songs goes wild. But usually like you have one anthem that has a little bit of cross like pop flavor that could somehow, you know, be perceived as something that could actually be in the mm-hmm. Billboard 100s. But like once Flume, you make sort of. Flume, Shore, or like... A, who else? Bicep is another guy who has like really popular techno tracks um, that have a lot of cr- crossplay because they use like pop elements and me- melody and stuff. Mm-hmm. And by having a track like that, you could instantly propel yourself way up because the algorithm will help you out on the way. Um, yeah. Similar to what you were saying, my girlfriend had she was she's getting she got into DJ techno and she really likes a specific kind of techno, which is like kind of harder Berlin based or European style of like harder techno. And she was like, you know, I search up techno on YouTube and all of the stuff has a million views and none of it is like what I'm looking for. Mm. And that's kind of the issue, right? Like, because you're like generalizing a whole genre into one, it's kind of harder to find what you're looking for. And techno still to this day is used as like an umbrella term, kind of like EDM is. So it's very hard to find what you're looking for unless you have like Mm. um, a DJ that you like or a friend who's like super well versed in it to help you like nick pick yeah all of it. so yeah totally right i think it, the way it's worked for me is like i just like someone plays some band in front of me and then i give it a chance you know mm-hmm. and then it's like okay i'm i'm listening to this and i'm appreciating it but hardly ever uh well i would say hardly ever but like it's not common to find a really mm-hmm. good track just out of nowhere mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. I feel like that's I feel like that's me with like hip hop, for example. Like I haven't actively dug for hip hop in a really long time. Mm. Uh, but stuff like even like Drake and stuff, like I hear it in the car when my when I'm with my friends and I'm like, oh, this is cool. I like <laughs> this. Like <laughs> this is all right. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. I feel like Drake gets so much hate these days though. From from hip hop heads or whatever. I guess I don't know. It, it depends. He, I think I think he as a person is uh, there's a lot to be said about Drake as a person as to way he functions in music, but his songs, if you look at them objectively, they're good pop songs. Like they're catchy, they're they're fun. Some of them Hotline have like Bling. interesting. Yeah, Hotline Bling. Fire. I like Hotline Bling. I like Controller a lot. 
all of the stuff that he made on that album was cool. Um, I think Drake as a person though likes to take things from other cultures and not give back to them or like mm. likes to he he has this like weird superiority complex, especially with the stuff that's coming out in the UK because a lot of the influence he gets is from Caribbean Caribbean culture and a lot of UK culture that he like kind of mixes in together. And he'll use like this fake guise of like, well, I grew up in Toronto and there's a lot of Jamaicans in Toronto. And like, you know, like dude, <laughs> no way. you were, you, you were a child star in Toronto and you were like making big bucks at the age of 12. You didn't grow up in the hood where the oldest Jamaican guys were. So like, and that's like a well-known fact. Um, people oh, in the UK yeah. always give Drake a lot of like shit for being a culture vulture. And I, I can mm. see where it comes from. Even in hip hop in the US, like Earl Sweatshirt called him out being a culture vulture. So wow. there's there's That's a lot scary. of stuff that like exactly like like you're making money off another person's culture without like making you know doing anything for them. Mm-hmm. I guess that's my biggest gripe with Drake. But at the same time I'm able to appreciate when he can make a good pop song. The the classic like it's so good that you can get over the the bad parts about it, you know. I mean dude in in my feelings you know that Kiki song Vaguely? What, yeah, by go? Drake. Kiki, do you love me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Drake? Banger, dude. Like, that's such a banger. I heard that in a, in, in a car. I didn't even know it was Drake. I was like, dude, this song is sick. Like, it's catchy. It has everything I like about it. I don't know. It's fair. Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm in the same boat, I would say. Yeah. I'll, I'll very rarely, but I will <laughs> occasionally listen to Drake. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on a whim. Uh, but... Anywho, uh, you know, I did have a, a weird comment about when we were talking about EDM. Mm-hmm. Do you think EDM has anything to do with MDMA or like, do they sound similar on purpose? Potentially. Potentially. Uh, I haven't really thought, I've never heard that that thought before, so it's an interesting <laughs> one. Um, I don't know. I, I, that would, I literally just thought that when we were talking about it, it just came to my head. It's like, is that some sort of weird, like, you know, people just obviously like when you're talking about that era that you were talking about that's a very like mdma heavy scene you know like people mm-hmm. are not maybe there for the music they're there to be having an insane yeah. serotonin high and that's that's coupled with the way those are festivals are organized as well like um compared to european club nights you will have like berlin for example we were talking about earlier is dark rooms uh, not a lot of lighting, one strobe, maybe three or four strobes, and that's it. Whereas mm-hmm. at American festivals, it's a whole spectacle, and you have this like pretty mm-hmm. lights and big effects, lasers, and all that. Like, and that kind of plays into what you're saying, right? Like, people yeah. are there more for the spectacle, more for the serotonin oh, rush or whatever. It's a carnival. So, <laughs> exactly. They're there for, you know, the carnival aspect, and less so the music. And that it's not exactly what I'm about. Like, mm-hmm. I'll be happy in a room full of like maybe five, ten people. And, a stroke going off like that's that's my ideal yeah. right now like you know like i'll be way happier if it's like more emphasis on the music and a good sound system <sighs> i totally agree i think some of the best life experiences i've personally had have just been dancing to techno in like weird okay. spaces that are dark and like mm-hmm. cool and <laughs> not yeah not crazy and and where you're from like i think the bay area did a really like has been doing really really interesting stuff with mm. regards to like the diy scene like <sighs> Um, the dome show been, or whatever yeah the dome show was cool uh, that's the one that we did actually but in the bay i've been to ones by uh this is one really cool promoter so if any of the listeners of which i'm assuming some of your friends might mm. be listening who are from the bay uh nice ones they're a really really good promoter in the bay they do uh gabber uh hardcore like intense electronic music jungle they do like they do underground raves i've been to one of their raves in richmond at like this ex-military warehouse and oh my god it was it that's was what i meant not i mean i also did mean the don't but there was like yeah like the not submarine but they were in bunkers or something there's a bunker yeah 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 i heard my friend went to that and like holy moly that it was crazy. sick and i was like wow this this is fun i have a couple of videos from that night i'll show you later dang yeah um, please i'd love to they're cool uh there's a record store in san francisco called rs nine four oh. 109 something they throw shows under this title called locad um they throw shows within their store and it's a cool record store as well like they have a really good selection of house and techno so if you're trying to buy records like they're a good resource for that um but they also throw shows within their record store and at warehouses well obviously COVID 19 has slowed it down but i've been Mm. to shows both at the record store and at the warehouses and both of them have been really authentic and like pretty damn near to like a european night out oh shit 
pretty impressive. Um, and the music was solid, and it was all like you know they're really they're really cautious about who they book and uh, they're smart about how they're going about it. You know, do a lot of European people come over here? Uh, For, San Francisco, like, not so much. LA, yeah, LA, LA has a bigger scene definitely mm. because I guess they have more money. San Francisco is like. I guess the changing landscape of San Francisco has a lot to do with that. Like, you know, a lot of the authentic people who were part of the San Francisco scene in the 90s have now dissipated out into the various Bay Area locations because of rent prices and the increasing mm. gentrification of San Francisco. So San Francisco definitely isn't what it used to be in, let's say, like 2000. Oh, yeah, um, totally. And even in like on a night out now in San Francisco, if you go to one of the major clubs, like you'll see a lot of people who feel like they're not supposed to be there, like, or like they don't know what they're doing exactly, but and like mm. they're there for like the spectacle again to get drunk with their friends, and like push people around and stuff, which isn't as, it's not the most pleasant experience. And that's why mm. I would, I would definitely prefer like a DIY scene in San Francisco, because if you want to be there, you're there. Like there's no like two ways about it, right? Like if you yeah. know about it, like there, and you're going, there's like a chance that you'll be there to like respectfully behave in like a crowd and stuff. So mm -hmm. So yeah, nice ones. RS are really good as well. Um, Club Chai is another one. I think they focus over like um, Middle Eastern and Asian uh, producers, and they have like a collective that make that throw shows. I went to a warehouse one with Noel actually from KDBS. We, me, him, and a bunch of other people went, and that was really cool. So if there's anyone in the Bay who's looking for like nights to go out to for house and techno or electronic music in general that doesn't that don't suck and you don't need to be 21 to go, uh, RS is a really good one. Lop Chai, nice ones. Definitely check those out. Hell yeah. I've been dreaming about going to a show, but I mean, COVID has definitely... Yeah, it's in the way, but you know, hopefully it won't last forever. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's this interesting thing we'll we'll overcome it in some way i feel like it's just inevitable that like mm -hmm. people love to dance more than maybe they really should for safety yeah yeah <laughs> there'll be some sort of a plan maybe everyone just goes yeah. into suits or something like just... yeah hazmat suits in a rave that'd be cool that'd be very 90s of us oh yeah totally the, the <laughs> warehouses oh my god um sick yeah i know that was a really fun topic let's just talk more generally though like diy spaces you we kind of got into it at the end there just mm -hmm. what's your uh what's your like job title or not job title but perhaps more mm -hmm. what how do you participate in like the diy scene so current for the past like i guess three years now i've been doing um helping out with house shows within the davis scene and for kdbs and even non-kdbs just like being there helping set up helping book bands, whatever I can do. Um, I've thrown two raves in Davis, both at um, at the Domes, uh, which was super fun. They were really, really nice about it. And we had some really, really great fun. And it was a super, super sick night. And we did really well as well, like monetary wise, because we weren't trying to make any money off it. It was like totally for the artists. So we actually spent, all, we gave away, like I think it was 200 for artists, which was way more than what we were expecting. You know, they came all the way out from the Bay to come play. Um, so that was super fun. So I guess because I'm not like an events director, it's like kind of free form what I do because, and that like gives me the flexibility to like throw events when I want to, um, you know, start working on one whenever I can. Um, and there's no like regimented thing like, oh, you need to do this by this point or something like that. Mm. But there are other people in the scene who've like done a lot of work with like throwing house shows and stuff. And whenever they need help or they need help promoting, um, I'll, I'll help out and do whatever I can or give them suggestions for bands and stuff. Same thing with like live in Studio Way, which is mm. one, when you attended that one time, the KDBS <laughs> thing, which yeah. is, I think, I think that's like the one biggest thing that um, we've, we've done for like local bands that they get a space mm. that they can come into and like, you know, perform and um, have their music video recorded and stuff and put on YouTube and then they can use it as a promotional tool. Uh, that's one way that like I've always tried recommending bands that, you know, might want to roll through and like bands of the mm. area and stuff. So, I guess that's kind of how I function within the scene. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> Dang. So um, you mentioned Lisa or the the live in studio A experiences. Like, is that something that you wish you could do professionally, or is that 
probably just going to be like this sort of DIY side or not that you, you used to do them, I guess you don't even do them mm -hmm. anymore, but yeah, I don't do them anymore. It's been about two years since I was Lisa director, but I still help out whenever I need to be, yeah. need, they need help. Or usually it's more to the booking side because the guys who are doing it now are like way better than way better, like sound management than I ever mm. was. Uh, <laughs> but I, I like helping out with the booking side of things. Mm. Um, it's, I don't know if it's something I want to do long-term. I'm definitely interested in it. Like once I get if once I get like a little more knowledge about it, I think it'll be really fun to do, but I'm starting chemical engineering at school. So like Ooh. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do like something, I guess, science-based and my love for music is definitely a hobby and mm. it's something that I'll definitely keep as like a weekend, you know, weekend warfare kind of thing. Like, you know, go all out on the weekend and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully like, you know, during the week, like, you know, make your, yeah. make your daily living. I'm trying to do that way, but like it's, it gets really hard to manage as well with like school versus extracurricular yeah. activities and stuff so yeah i'm sure i feel like it's like in college at least you have like short breaks where you'll have like a week to like work on a project and like get mm -hmm. something done but mm -hmm. every now and then and there, there is like space for it but once you get into the 40-hour work week you're definitely it's like you just worked for eight hours now do some yeah. more work you know it's it's a little harder to find the time unfortunately the biggest eye-opener for me was my brother because he, he was actually the one who got me into house when I was really young. Because he went to uni in 2005 in Manchester. Oh, wow. And I was eight years old at the time. He came back one summer loving electronic music and showing me all this stuff. And I was, like, really overwhelmed. Because I was a punk kid. Like, I like punk. I didn't I didn't take any electronics. I was like, ah, oh, this is back, blah, blah, blah. But over time, like, I softened up to it. And he, from, like, 2005 to 2014, every year, every weekend was out raving in Manchester or London. Like, you know. Wow. experiencing the changes in the rave scene blah 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 now he's 30 and he can't like stay stay up past 12 <laughs> wow. so so like you know he's like so jaded from it he's like you know i wish i could go till three and that's kind of what like working full-time does to you so i'm trying mm. to like milk milk my time out where i can stay up till like mm. 48 hours at a time raving i'm trying to i'm trying to keep i'm trying to keep my you know my ah! stamina up for now <laughs> trying yeah. to milk it while i can so. well if you get a solid job i think in a funny way, I feel like job cultures, especially in the Bay, if you get if you get lucky. I mean, not that I'm really for the corporate culture, absolutely mm -hmm. not. But it seems uh, that like people have opened up to giving more time off to, mm -hmm. to the people. Like, like that's becoming a little bit more popular, at least in California. So right, right. at least like because like Coachella is a thing, and a lot of people that have full time jobs definitely go to Coachella. So right, you people find the time, and like that's obviously like, i'm not a huge fan of that yeah. thing at all like we can get into that if you want yeah the truth of coachella i've been meaning to to, to be honest like that. i've never really even like thought about coachella much because i always think about like some vague distant thing that a lot of like you know it's kind of again it's like a spectacle right like people who mm. even are like um not too into not into music as seriously as you know you and i maybe you are like not to say like, like we're super serious about it, but like, you know, we actively look for music and like, you know, it's not just like, we try to keep up with local scenes and stuff, but Coachella is like definitely not our market, I guess. Mm. It's definitely like not aimed at us. And like, I guess some things have like a place in the world where they definitely make a lot of money and they put a lot of cool artists on sometimes and the headliners and stuff, but I'm just not too fussed about it because I know it's not targeted at me. So like, is I'm not their main person who's going to be buying like a 700 weekend ticket or whatever, yeah. however expensive it is, <laughs> way out of my budget. And definitely, it is, I'm not, yeah. I'm not the, I'm not the target audience. I feel, I think the, 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 the thing that, that totally like seals the deal for me, for them though, is that like they are owned by a fairly conservative pro Trump person that I heard like about that exploiting, you know, the, yeah. at least the LGBT scene, I would say. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like there's also that's another sort of interesting thing is I feel like in the U.S. and in the world in general probably like queer culture and techno culture have very much I think collided. Would that be a fair way of saying it? I don't even like they're just like they're not even not even not even collided. I think uh, it was birth birthed yeah. birthed birth. I guess like it uh, came. by yeah it came from gay black men in you know, the inner cities of Chicago and Detroit. Like, there's no yeah. two ways about it. Like, the word the word house, like, people ask me, like, you know, why is it called house music? And, like, 
it comes from drag culture. That's that's where the term house music comes from, drag culture, because it all started with um, a house. And there's a really good documentary if everyone hasn't seen it. Me and my girlfriend watched it called Paris is Burning, which is about um, drag drag queens in New York. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was in New York. And a house was the people they lived with, you know, it was the people they performed with, the people that they mm-hmm. ran away from their homes because, you know, they felt like they weren't understood or they were being marginalized in their community. So they ran away and they lived in their houses with you know, other people with similar mindsets and from the same community. And that's where that house came from. And there were multiple houses and they would Mm. come and, you know, have drag queen, drag queen shows. And they would have like um, drag battles where they have Vogue battles against each other. And that's kind of where the term house music came from, because the music that was being played at those shows was kind of like sped up disco with a, with a kick drum behind it. Mm. Right. And that's that's kind of like and people don't really people don't even remember that this happened in New York and in Chicago. And people just like completely forget about that, that that ever happened. Mm. And then techno is Detroit's take on it, which is where they took that element and incorporated like the steel city vibes of, you know, Detroit, which is like it's a cold, hard place to be. You know, Detroit is like it's pretty cold. It's mechanical. There's a lot of industry there. And that influence definitely is heard in the techno music that was came that came out in Detroit. So they took that element of like you know the niceties of house music and kind of made it a little darker, a little more, mm-hmm. you know, industrious. Ah, uh, yeah, you're totally. Remind- I've also watched a documentary of on house and like, it seems like house music was definitely like a a place for for black you know gay people queer people and just like you know like queer people as well and generally it was a very much a mm-hmm. diverse crowd still but um consistently with you know kind of get shut down by racists throughout the 20th century mm-hmm. you know, like all these like, clubs would go for like five ten years and then the cops would show up and like end it or whatever you know like mm-hmm. stonewall riots etc but yeah uh, cops increasing rent prices uh, you know lack oh, of yeah. diy spaces a lot of these things are just like like a multivariate decline in like the popularity of the genre or like the true genre, I guess, or like the roots mm-hmm. of the genre. Um, I guess it's, it's, it took a lot a common trope that people like to talk about is like, it took a white European man to popularize it. You know what I mean? Like for him to show everyone like, Oh, look what these black guys are doing. And now I'm going to profit off of mm-hmm. like showing you how cool it is. Right. Like, cause, cause it blew up in, in Europe and that's just kind of how it goes. Yeah. And to this day, like, uh, some of the originators of that, like original sound of like Detroit techno or like Chicago house and stuff, I've seen their sets in the US and I've seen their sets in the UK. And they're very, very different. Like when they're in the UK, they play rarer selections, selections that I would never have heard of. They don't play any of their own productions or anything, which is really weird. And then they come to the US and they play their hits. Mm. So it, I, I guess in my head, I'm thinking like, is it because the U.S. isn't too familiar with their work still? But they're from here. Like, wh- why is that? You know, like they have to play their hits in the U.S. Whereas in the U.K., they're playing like their their rare cuts. You know, like unreleased stuff. Like, because it's a little more I nuanced. Think there, cultural I guess. difference, probably right. Like that. Mm-hmm. The U.S. Yeah, people come to hear songs they've heard before. Like that's such a classic. Like, oh, I'm mm-hmm. going to the show. I hope he plays the song that I love. Right, you know? right, right. Like, or like same just... with the band, right? You're like, oh, I hope they play this one so I can sing yeah, along. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, um, it's, it's, it's very. Mer- I don't. I mean, maybe in techno or in the Euro- in the Europe scene, it's just like people are just there for the atmosphere too. Like that's mm-hmm. like a bigger part. Like, and it's more fun to hear something you've never heard before. You know, to be surprised. Right. I, I think. I think the the idea of like a selection the selection of a dj is more prominent over there because like you go to see a dj less so on like the hits that they have but more so on like how good their sets are and like what they're playing you know like if there's something that you were like instantly trying to shazam during their set mm. that you've never heard and shazam has no idea what it is you definitely want to go see that dj again like you're <laughs> like oh shit i need to hear some more stuff like that right yeah and that's kind of how they get their bookings is like based on their sets Whereas in America, it's like, you know, hey, do they have like a number one article about them? Like, do they have a lot of hits and stuff like that? So, or is there is their production? Do they have like a number one hit or something? Yeah. That's so interesting. Man, it just shows how like, it's like weird because I was going to say like, I feel like Europe has been copying black people in music forever. Like the Beatles, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and <laughs> there's just so many kind of iterations where that happened throughout our history. Right. But, uh, it, it, the scene Europe is just like 
they're I guess more socialist even in and so it, it leaks into the music in a way whereas like here it's still so cold-hearted capitalist like it's all about being number one and having the most plays and having the most right. money and like playing Madison Square Garden and you know like, right, right, right. like we're all aware of all that ridiculousness like yeah it, yeah it's just the, the polarization of you know capitalization and capital capitalism in the U.S. is so like you can't run away from it you know what I mean uh, you can you can in the UK either but, or in Europe either but there's still like ways that people there's a lot of there's a lot of more like welfare state or oriented things mm. in the UK that may give you a little more freedom to work around and don't get me wrong the UK still has a lot of problems with that type of stuff as well but absolutely I would say they're still doing slightly better than the US's <laughs> isn't that amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> only slightly better and these are like yeah the, slightly better because there's the most like free whole... countries or whatever yeah, there's like a whole there's a, there's a whole debate about like how the UK, um, you know, increasing rent prices or like the shutting down of community centers. Like, you know, there was a time in the UK where a lot of people learned how to DJ at youth centers, which was like funded by like the Labour Party, um, mm. left wing, left wing party in the UK. They funded these like youth centers for people to come, young kids to come and learn a trade. So it could be like you know sewing or emceeing or DJing or anything like any, anything that they want to do like those youth centers were really prominent in the mid 2000s and then they all got shut down because of fun like lack of funds and conservatives took over and they you know mm. it's kind of like a cycle in the UK where conservatives come and cut funds labor party comes and you know puts the funds back in and it's like a yeah. continuous oh cycle it's been happening for a while so that but right so now like we've had a we've had a string of like conservatives for quite a while and you've noticed a lot of youth centers being shut down so that's like one thing that's uh, kind of similar, so I guess, in US and UK. Yeah. Didn't like shoegaze come out of like youth centers? Like, I'm pretty sure that's how like most of that scene met each other. <laughs> We're just like, <laughs> likely, I guess. Yeah, probably like DIY spaces or youth centers. I'm I'm not sure, but probably. I think if My Bloody Valentine. I watched like a documentary about that. I mm -hmm. think they met in a youth center. So. Wow. There you go. But yeah, yeah, you don't oh you don't really hear stories like that anymore. Like someone meeting at a youth center. Like mm -hmm. I had to research what a youth center was. <laughs> like, yeah. I had no idea what it was. So yeah, that, that does not exist in the North American states. You, I guess you have YMCA's, but like <laughs> I've never been to a YMCA. I feel like that's I, I've I've actually heard some interesting stuff that YMCA has like skating parks. They have like skate parks and stuff. Whoa, oh, maybe I was not yeah. a, in San Diego. One of my housemates actually was telling me that the YMCA is like a skate park. I was like. Young male Christian authority authorizes <laughs> <laughs> authorizes skating. That's cool, I guess. <laughs> Dang, I mean that, that's just them adapting to the scene, right? Like they just want to be relevant. Like yeah, I guess. Yeah. It's SoCal, man. They have so many kids <laughs> on skateboards. It's insane. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna actually be down there uh, next month, so I'll be we'll see. Maybe I'll hit, I'll hit the the YMCA skate. Yeah, place in San Might as well. I mean, you've been getting into skating, right? I've seen yeah, your all these, dude. Yeah, you're getting, you're getting there. <laughs> it, are you? Have you done much skating yourself? Uh, I used, yeah, I used to skate a lot freshman year, but I was never very good at it. Like I could mm. do an ollie, and that's about it. Um, but I've always been interested in skate culture because I guess the mm. overlap with punk music is like I grew up into the in the two thousands, which the major like punk movement and skate punk movement was kind of taking place in the late 90s mm. seeping into the into the 2000s games like tony hawk made soundtracks really popular right like tony hawk yeah. was like a big part of my life and <laughs> because of that i was getting into like vhs tapes and like dvds of like skate videos so this is like a bunch of skate videos that i used to like really adore oh, as a kid who's your favorite skater rodney mullen i know it's like an easy pick it's an easy pick like like everyone will say like oh why is your favorite like he's the biggest one or like he's like the the founder of like he's modern day tricks, always, like street skating he but like he's just always. he's so cool to watch like he's just fun to watch and i know there's like a lot of like underground wow. skaters and stuff that like i'm not too aware of because mm. i haven't been like actually following it but also like i was in pakistan growing up so it's hard to like mm. you know keep up with what the underground is doing at that time only thing <laughs> i got was like the big guys right mm. the ones who were like on the, on the, the big stages and stuff yeah, 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 like Ty, is it Tyja or something, or something like that? Like, Nigel like Houston. Nigel Houston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, He's from Davis actually, or Woodland or something. Oh wow. Huh. Yeah, he was in Davis like I think last year doing another 
like skating thing or something because davis is like quite notorious for its skate spots there's a really famous spot i think on rock hall or Boehner hall or one of the halls that is like one of the really famous skate spots so, oh word yeah a lot of skaters i've seen a lot of skaters on campus actually like coming to like video video themselves and stuff yeah. i mean i think universities tend to have that like uc berkeley also has a spot that i keep seeing people shooting like whenever i'm over yeah. there it, it's actually overrun with skaters right now because like the campus is gone for summer so it's just like all the high school kids are like yo we're in college now <laughs> take ideal college. right like you have an empty campus no authority yeah. nothing like hey let's skate here Oh, sounds, yeah, totally. sounds sounds apt to me <laughs> <laughs> well we're doing pretty well we're at like 40 minutes is there any major things you wanted to talk about uh or mm. talk to me or more yeah major things uh uh mm. shout outs i guess shout outs that i wanted to give out mm. um shout out to cozy in sack she's a producer who makes like a grime garage somewhat in between 140 music she makes really really cool stuff uh tooth in sack he's a producer and a dj like really really cool uh in the bay we have tony manfrey uh select Island from woodland noho as well noel that's like that's my homie shout out to him dj pan princess uh I thought of like a list in the shower and I've forgotten about all this. <sighs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, a lot of these guys, if you're like trying to get into more electronic music, I definitely Yeah. Like Please send me those links and I'll put them in the YouTube description. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, any other things I want to talk about? I'm, I'm like, just like, I feel like the one thing that, like, you know, uh, it might be worth getting into before we go is just really quick, like, I guess. Um, like is techno like where is it gonna like evolve to like what is the next level you know is it is it like is tech because to me it seems like techno has always been like this thing that like you like go back in time like to what people were listening to in the 90s and it's like it's still listenable but it's like mm-hmm. we've, we've just evolved so much like it like i don't mm-hmm. know i listen to harrison uh, H H D B. It's like three letters. Um, H D B. Harrison B D B. Harrison. Oh, Harrison B D B. Yeah. B D. Yeah. I yeah. always get those last three letters a little mixed up, but yeah, um, yeah. that song or like he's got some really great tracks where I'm just like, this mm-hmm. is just quintessential. Like I think I might listen to this for the rest of my life. Or like Matthew Foberg's "Please Stay" with the horns. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. He just just keeps tapping them, and it's like yeah, yeah. And those seem like such like crazy peaks for me in terms of like what it can mm-hmm. be done with like music. Mm-hmm. Like it's just like panning and all the different tones and ah oh, man, it's just like I, th- I think it's important to like realize like how far we've come because if you listen to like a lot of the older tracks from like ninety three, ninety four, you can like hear the improvement in in production quality just because you know digital digital media is much more accessible now and anyone can make a track nowadays on a laptop. Uh, it's more accessible to get used gear and stuff like that. Uh, whereas in the '90s, it was all analog. Like you had to like do everything like you know through a MIDI MIDI channel. You didn't have a computer workspace, and the computer was literally there to just like record the track or whatever. Yeah. Um, so like you can definitely hear the changes there. Uh, as to where techno is gonna go, I'm not really sure actually because there's so many like mini scenes across the techno stream. Like there's minimal techno. There's like you know the really aggressive Berlin techno and like not not in Berlin, but like there's a really big scene in Poland right now, which is like really intense, really fast paced techno, which is what my girlfriend's into actually. And like she (laughs) digs for it way more than I am. I do. So like, that's how I got into it. And I've been like listening to a lot of the stuff that she recommends. Um, Like there's so many like different like microcosms that are just like uprooting. But I I wouldn't say like the nineties is irrelevant because a lot of the stuff that they're making today is still very reminiscent of some of the things from the 90s. Like they're taking elements from 90s mm. production and now incorporating new technology to it. So it's all, it's, they're not exactly reinventing the wheel, I'd say, but they're definitely using elements from the 90s and like, you know, putting them in a modern landscape and then mm. giving it out to users. So it's people like to say like techno is always in cycles and people are always like, you know, taking things from the past and like rehashing them into something new and i think that's kind of what's happening oh. right now 
Is um, it sampling like that just forever? Like we're just exactly like, oh, but shit. like the only only difference is now that the techno guys are sampling like jazz, soul, funk, you know, breaks. They were they were sampling that stuff, and now we're sampling them or we're <laughs> taking ideas from them. So it's like a a second hand almost, like you know, it's mm. a second hand interpretation yeah. of ideas because you're not purveyors of the sound anymore. You're like you know biting, not even like kind of biting off their sound, I guess, if you or like you know. Trying to reimagine their sound, I guess. Mm. I mean, we're definitely so. not doing any dig creating or um, lo- yeah, vinyl like crate, crate digging. <laughs> so it's a completely different like landscape. Yeah, I'd say. people who are like seriously into the techno scene. Some people are like really, really into dig cre- digging for crates has like become a thing again. Like especially oh, wow. in Europe and in and in the USA, that's definitely a thing now. Uh, like that store I was telling you about RS in is RS is short for record store. <laughs> that's that's good. and that's in San Francisco. Like that place is like really good cheap, cheap records that are like one dollar bin records. And those are actually what a lot of the big DJs in the underground scene make their money off. Like they take a cheap record from the dollar bin, play it out to a crowd, and the crowd's like, Oh my god, this is amazing. We must have it. And that just instantly shoots up the price of this one dollar record that is now worth three hundred dollars on on eBay. Really? So and that that's kind of what what's been happening. Like there's whole like charts of like some famous DJs. Like there's this one DJ called Francesco Del Garda. He's I think he's Italian. Um, he's just a DJ. He doesn't produce. He he's simply known for DJing and simply known for his selection because he is a great digger and like he digs for records. And this guy's hand is like he has uh, the meatiest hand. Okay, like he anything he touches turns to gold. Okay. <laughs> Anything he buys or anything he plays is worth like a dollar. He plays it, and someone in the comments will be like, "FDG played this, and the price just skyrockets for this vinyl because it's from the '90s, or it's like, like three hundred percent increases. It's crazy." Yeah, like this is a Discogs racket or some shit. This is this is all about Discogs. Like Discogs has like lists of what big DJs are playing, and that's kind of like how a lot of older records are being brought to attention. And wow. some of it is actually a lot of US stuff because US stuff is like. There was such a lot of records being produced in the 90s and half of them are sitting in dollar bins in the US. Mm. And the ones that did make it over to the UK were in dollar bins, but people bought them. Big DJ played them, price skyrocketed. And now the US people who have it lying around in their basement, they're like, well, I had this record for 20 years. I didn't make any money off it. I'm going to sell it now for $300 in the US, you know? <laughs> so I guess cultures change. Like some, some tunes weren't, considered big tunes in the 90s but now people who never got to experience an abundance of that style mm. are now listening to that song be like, this song is crazy you know um, that is so crazy oh my god yeah wow bringing so, it all back exactly and that's kind of like what i'm trying to do with my i'm been working on my vinyl collection i don't have a turntable right now but eventually mm. i'm gonna buy get a set of turntables and because I'm, I'm i'm essentially a dj i don't produce so mm. the only way to like i guess make your name Strolly of DJing is by having rare cuts that no one's heard of. And the only way to do that is to go through the dollar bins because if you're going mm. through like the rare stuff that's like $300, someone's already played it. You know, that's why it's $300. So, Dang. yeah. Side hustle. Is that yeah. what we're talking? Wow. Yeah. I've been, I've been <laughs> buying records left, right, and center uh, recently just because I'm home and like, you know, there's nothing much to do other than school. Yeah. So, I've been trying to work on my vinyl collection and find rare cuts that I think might go off. And, Really excited to try it on Davis Crowd, so hoping that we can throw an event soon, like, you know, after COVID-19 is over or whatever. Yeah, That'd be really cool. That. Yeah. yeah, it would be really, really cool to, like, try out some of the new stuff. And a lot of the other DJs from the Davis scene are, you know, working on their track collection as well, so really It'd be promising. really cool to see Davis have, like, a consistent, like, house scene or, like, just dance techno scene. I feel like... I, th- I think, I think the pockets. radio station... Sorry, go on. Oh, I was just gonna say, there's, like, been pockets, but not, like... Like imagine doing going to a show every month. Like that would be insane. That's just like every month. Yeah. Like people, some people go to techno shows every day. Yeah, there's like a a multitude of reasons as to like why that currently isn't possible. I think we're getting there. But one is like um, DIY spaces are the only places that will accept this type of music mm. because the big clubs like Catmore Rio or whatever, which I wouldn't want to throw. It's just like a Thai. It's a Thai restaurant that turns into a dance floor at night and they play pop music and like they're never gonna want us to be there like a bunch mm. of like punks and hippie kids like you know <laughs> trying yeah. to throw down to some techno or stuff i don't think they'd ever <laughs> accept us that way um 
and nor nor do we want to go down the commercial route right like we're not trying to make money off it we're trying to just like have fun and like you know give some artists that are from the bay like give them like a place to play and play to college kids who are like mm. you know trying to get into something new which is kind of what i was trying to do with the raves that we threw um there's that sure. whole issue of finding a diy finding spaces in davis is like really really hard to do right now because you know people are so quick to call the cops and for house music and techno music you need like <laughs> really good sound system like to have and to have people like really appreciate it you know mm. a good sound system good lighting because if you can draw them in with the music you're going to draw them in with the lighting that's like as a booker that's what i'm doing right like in my head i'm like i need good graphics because i know people are going to come here and some of them are going to look for that serotonin thrill or whatever that we mm. talked about so i need like um shout out to dj cherry blossom and dj y2k because they helped me with visuals on my last two Raves and they put it on the projector screen and like you know mm. all the people who wanted the spectacle got that from the visuals you know mm. that type of thing. It kind of reminds me of that one dome show with the projector. <gasps> Amar, what's happened to Amar? Oh yeah, we're back. Uh, your video's not on. Okay, perfect. Is that cool? <laughs> yeah, what happened? Is DC or something? no idea what happened ah, but uh yeah. but yeah we were saying you try drawing people in with the visuals so that's like mm. that's what we're trying to do um but yeah another issue is that davis as such i would say there isn't one genre that everyone is super interested in other than like i guess like borderline indie rock which is something that everyone can get into you know that's <laughs> usually what we we book at the house shows and stuff it's the easiest one to book because there's just an abundance of indie bands mm. that are just like down to play yeah um, and it can get it can get really stale after a while because everyone's playing the same beach rock or like mm. something influenced by the you la the Bay or from sac or whatever. usually it's from la dude like a lot of la bands uh like to play this sort of like beach influence surf rock you talk to sad girl <laughs> yeah sad girl or like yeah sad sad girl the growlers ask uh, mm. what else is there like um the oc's influence stuff like mm. that like you know like burger records that whole scene there's a lot of bands that like kind of like oh, develop their comes up every episode man <laughs> i mean like that they're so big in the indie scene like they're everyone's so influenced by that sound and especially the la scene that they export mm. it up to the bay and people love it and they eat it up but people in la are kind of sick of it as well because it's so like you know it's abundant mm. there it's kind of like yeah. we were talking about techno right like it's not abundant the 90s sound wasn't abundant you know same thing yeah so I guess that's like a, a contentious point that there isn't as such a scene for any genre in Davis. So to make people consistently, you know, appreciate the house nights that we threw. People love the raves. The reviews were great. Everyone was like super stoked about it. But in order to like consistently throw on, you need to like, you know, draw them in each time. And that takes like, you know, smart event planning, DIY space availability, which is like really hard to come by. Um, and I'm not. Sh- I'm still like trying to figure out how to tackle it the best, and how to put on the best spectacle for people. So. The best spectacle. <laughs> yeah, like because like for the me, it's like experience. Not, yeah, the best experience. Something for everyone, right? Like the people mm. who are here for the music will come for the music, and the people who are there for the spectacle will come for the spectacle. You know, I'm trying to get the best of both worlds. The community can come together from all sides. It, that is right. such a. <laughs> that's like what you have to do in America, because I mean, there's just so many. Like I remember any Davis show. I feel like there's like. The crowd that actually watches the bands, and then there's the crowd that just smokes cigarettes and socializes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm 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 definitely the one who's at the front of the crowd, like, like <laughs> being interested. In case and like, I feel I feel like I feel like I'm like I'm, I'm like an old head in the scene now because like I'm always like wagging my finger, people like shut up, the band is playing, like you know, <laughs> stop stop talking, I'm trying to listen. You <laughs> know, like turn the mics you're, off. You know? You're you're a DJ, at KDS, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the community the, members, dude, the respecting yeah. of the. Yeah, I actually wanted to, you brought it up, or you didn't bring it up directly, but like bring, like the whole like scene experience, because uh, mm-hmm. Katya and I uh, booked WEF together this year before mm-hmm. COVID-19, you know, mm-hmm. destroyed all hopes and dreams of that. But um, mm-hmm. that was such an interesting experience. We got like a decent number of bands from SAC that I had never heard of that were like indie adjacent, you know, like, mm-hmm. like, 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 um, definitely following a sort of whatever like isn't techno it feels like it's like i don't feel like there's a lot of diversity in 
the bay except for like when you get to really like specific scenes but like i'm like the general scene can be very samey in terms of like you got two guitarists drummer and a bassist right 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 right, right. i mean like and you've been in the bass scene for quite a minute and yeah oh yeah he has a booker <laughs> so i'm sure like you have way more experience with that oh, i only see i only see what gets exported to davis and the, which and is the crew, so. you know yeah i feel like a lot of like solid homies that play like get solid gigs gigs in the bay end up just going to davis because it's easy like you can get a bunch of people to come to your show because it's the only right. show that night you know like right the bay is so big and you're always like fighting for attention in, oh yeah that's true you know, I, I guess we have it easy <laughs> <laughs> it's a little well, it's a it's like a best of both worlds sort of like right. well y- y- technically speaking you don't get as many shows but the ones you do get are pr- mm-hmm. like everyone comes out for i guess that's the right the nice benefit but yeah, um, that was just like. Hey, do you know anything about WEF? Are you familiar with the like the experience of the work? So the I've heard like, a I've played at WEF. So I played, uh, I Whoa. DJed at WEF last year with me and me and Noel played at WEF, and uh, the speaker cut out on me, which is quite unfortunate. And I also <laughs> played at the same time as uh, as the headliner did, Ila Bamba. So I got no crowd, which is like, it was whatever. Like, I, I wasn't too pressed about it. Like, I was like, oh, okay, whatever. I was more upset that the speaker cut out uh, yeah. <laughs> more than anything. Um, but uh, in the 90s, like, a lot of the older cats from Davis have spoken to me about, like, what WEF was. And it was actually, like, a, there was a, quite a big DJ scene at WEF. Like, people used to come and, like, trip out on psychedelics and, like, come dance to the music. And there was, like, wow. really interesting electronic music being played at WEF. But now it's, like, kind of devolved away from that and it's like mm. not as cool as it used to be um but no offense to wef like it's still, oh, still no, a really I mean, fun like, time like, like i am i'm just saying wef adjacent <laughs> yeah 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 um but even like wef does amazing things like it's like mm. it's still a really fun event and there's a lot of really hardworking people that go behind mm-hmm. it and i really respect what they do but i'm just saying in terms of music like there's not as much electronic music being no, portrayed yeah, out no. there now but uh but that's all i know about wef is that essentially I but i just know you. it used to be wild i know it used to be wild in the 90s like that's mm. what i've heard from people who are from the area that wef used to be the shit in the 90s. for like electronic music wow that's yeah. so crazy yeah i would love to like just like step into like a a camera and watch some of that <laughs> the footage, you know? yeah <laughs> that was like i'm sure yeah. there's like archives because they've been Must recording be. wef for, for a while uh, but yeah that was that was an interesting experience but you're right there unfortunately is like a expectation of a certain sound which they're trying to get away from a bit um Mm -hmm. because it's a little tired and a bit uh i don't want to say racist but like culturally appropriative there's a lot of that Mm -hmm. stuff that happens like they have a drum circle yeah yeah, always want to have a drum circle and it's like eh, not the best look I, I guess that's like that's it's kind of hard when you're throwing a big a full blown festival like that because you're as the booker you're in caught in between a, a rock and a hard place because a you want to put on something cool experimental that will you know turn a lot of kids on to like something cool and something diverse at the same time you want to make a net profit or a net at least break even point right when you're throwing a festival and that's well, they don't where actually the, it's all free. Is oh, it's free. Oh, it's free. But, but like, or even then, like, if not a profit, then you want to have something that people will write home about, like, oh, we had a great time. And like, yeah. you kind of have to cater to the crowd with a festival like WEF. Like, you can't mm-hmm. throw well, it out the scene. window. There's like the, yeah, the people that have exactly. been going for years and they have exactly. So you can't, you can't, you can't throw all that tradition and history out the window and be like, hey, we're going to throw something completely revolutionary and you're all going <laughs> to like it, right? <laughs> like, I, I don't think that would, yeah, I wish exactly. <laughs> At least one Same. year, like, because like people could survive one year of revolution, right? And then like next right. year, just back to bullshit, you know? No, nah, right, you right, shouldn't right. go back to the <laughs> bullshit. But yeah, like I don't, I don't, I feel like it's like you gotta have some crazy years where some experimental stuff happens or nothing changes. Progress, right? Is important. And I and I guess like if it's not profit driven, then why not? Yeah, no, I mean like the way it works is they're just they're honestly gonna probably disappear because of conservatism in the in the UC system, but. Uh, they're basically a part of the budget that everybody, every student. There, I think it's called ACU, ACDU, CCD, and KDBS yes. is under the under the same bracket. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's just getting funding from that yeah. like general arts uh, right. thing you pay when you pay tuition. So mm-hmm. 
it, they can get like ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars. Like the, that's their total budget. Um, yeah, there was a referendum passed where we increased like the number of dollars going from tuition towards ASUCD as a whole, which like affects KDBS, WEF, and everyone. And nice. we were all like super stoked about it, but then coronavirus hit. And spring is where a lot of ASUCD's profits come in or like break even points because it's, it's a nonprofit essentially, right? But mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that they have, like Give Day, for example, or Picnic Day, which are like really big events where we can like recover some of the losses that we occur in some of our other arts departments, right? That's like the big thing mm-hmm. because those aren't ha- because those aren't happening now. Like we're kind of stuck and like all our plans for growth and expansion of the arts with the fee referendum are kind of like, you know, put on hold right now because we incurred such big losses, WEF, KDBS, everyone in general at ECCD. So I guess coronavirus didn't help us out in any way, you know, yeah. kind of yeah, screwed yeah, us over. That yeah, it kind of screwed us over in that sense. But, that but like, yeah. I always remember like KDBS has like their fundraiser at the end of the year. And, like, yeah. Like and, and, and it was, it was something that all of us were really looking forward to. And mm. now that, you know, it was too hard to do a fundraiser where a, we don't have access to the station because we're trying to limit the number of people that go in there for COVID-19 and stuff. Yeah. Um, and right now we're still playing pre recorded archives, but hopefully by the summer we should have new shows rolling in and people can send in their shows and you should be hearing your favorite DJs on air again. So hopefully that's something to look forward to in the summer. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, are you going to stay in Davis? Uh, yeah, I'm around for the summer and then I'm, I might stay around in the Bay or figure out what I want to do. I'm not sure mm-hmm. exactly. Are you right. graduating soon? Like, yeah, soon? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, is this your final? Uh, yeah, I technically graduated already. Hey, so. yeah. congratulations. Yeah. So, That's awesome. Yeah, so there's that, there's that. I, um, so I don't know, I don't know if I want to stay in the area or not, but yeah, we'll see, we'll see. How, yeah, you but know, I definitely so. want to keep the, keep the DJing up and Hell keep yeah. the music taking out. And wherever I, wherever what, I am. 21? I'm 22. Hey. I'm yeah. 22 as well, but I'm about to turn 23. Uh, we're still so young. Like you can get that cam job, but like don't, yeah. you know, give up on your other dreams. You can still have those yeah. experiences. You only live once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's exactly. one exactly. One reference from earlier, uh, Drake <laughs> Yolo. <laughs> <laughs> Yolo. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of things that I'd really, I really I really appreciate the time that I spent at KDBS. So like the things I've learned from being in a DIY scene because there's so much potential that you can do with the, you know, just be like-minded individuals. So if there's people who are trying to start something, find people who are interested in the same thing as you are, or even not, and just try putting an amalgamation of all your ideas together and you can make something really cool happen. I think that's the biggest thing that KDBS has taught me. And, um, I, I grew up in Pakistan where there's not a lot of house and techno there's not a lot of like raves or anything, but there's a growing mm. culture of like people going abroad and experiencing this music and then coming back home and then not having anything to show for it. And mm. I would love, I, if I was living there right now, I would love to take the experiences and the things I learned from operating a DIY space here, mm. there, if I took it back home, because back home, you don't have to worry about police because there's no noise restrictions. People don't care. The police has way bigger issues to deal with than, wow. than noise restrictions. So we can party all night. No one will say anything to you. And DIY spaces are easy to come by. Um, abandoned warehouses are easy to come by. But I, I, I guess the whole thing would be like, you know, how do you get people who aren't into the music into the music? Right? Mm. So maybe maybe down the years, I have a couple of friends who are like, you know, really into the music as well as I am. And some of them are moving back home. And we were thinking about starting an online label together. Um, wow. a, Pakist- a Pakistani label where we have Pakistani artists our music and then hopefully make the records and then sell them abroad or something along those lines or you know just have like an event event slash label team where we try and do mm. something along those lines we'll see how it goes because it's, it's kind of in the pipeline right now but so crazy are you saying that like yeah. pakistan is like the new it place for potential diy music scene stuff definitely like not definitely not <laughs> because there's a lot of like it, it because in order to have the privilege to appreciate the music, you need to be a certain level in society because there's such a wealth gap in Pakistan, mm. or in at least the city that I'm in. There's, um, there's a very a small percentage of the population of Karachi, the city that I'm from, can appreciate DIY spaces and have time to do it, right? Mm. But And that's like the big thing. But the people who can, we can still throw events for them, you know, and then we're trying to do what we can. So... It's not definitely not the it place, but there I see some room 
And yeah. artists who are there currently will tell me like, nah, dude, we're done with it. We're so jaded. Like, you know, we tried and tried, but like, I still have some hope. You gotta, you gotta believe, right? Yeah, you gotta believe. And, <laughs> and, and I think, and I think the experiences that I've learned from like KDBS and being in Davis in general of DIY mm. spaces, if I could just replicate that back home, that would be, that'd be fun. You know, where, because KDBS house shows are all for, the artists like we don't we don't take any funds we give all the money to the artists we try putting on something cool for the people who attend the shows and then it's all donation based and then they can pay the artists um yeah. and that's like a win-win for everyone right essentially other than the fact that people are stingy and college kids don't have a lot of money um <laughs> apart from that like it's a win-win for everyone so if i could take that model back home where it's easier to throw diy events that'd be really cool totally that yeah I mean, that sounds like an insanely noble goal if you, if you yeah. pull that off. That would <laughs> That's like a goal. life goal right there. That sounds almost like deeper than just like a year. Like that would be, be really just like creating something totally new. But uh, yeah. so yeah, props to you. For the... <laughs> for I mean, it's in the pipeline right now, but like <laughs> we'll, 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 have a, we'll have a recap on this podcast like oh, 10 okay. years down the line. I'm hyped. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude. That'd be so sick. I'd love to imagine right. the 10 years what life will be like. Oh, crazy. 32. Yeah, I'd be 34. <laughs> I wouldn't want to think about it. Oh my God, I'd be 32 at that time. Wow. No, there's a lot more going on right now in 2020. We don't need to yeah. worry too much. But yeah, hell yeah. 2030. Yeah. That, that is a concept. Hopefully, we won't all be dead. Yeah, hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, well, I think that kind of wraps it up i think we got so many topics in and that's awesome i'm super hyped to mm -hmm. share this with the people because i feel like people, this is worthwhile to hear you know talk about if you care mm -hmm. about techno if you care about diy scenes i mean mm -hmm. this is this is the bread and butter of what the mm -hmm. whole world is about so such a pleasure amar thank you so much for coming on yeah thank you for having me it's really fun um, I'll probably put this up in like a few weeks. I'm like still taking my time just because I'm not trying to take any attention away from Black Lives Matter and right, 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 what's right. going on. But like, I think we'll start uploading them fairly soon just mm -hmm. with a big preface of like, yo, all the, like if you have money, donate for the causes, do the whole, like make a difference actually participate. Right. Like this is not trying to pretend like that's not going on. No silence mm -hmm. on that for sure. But anyways, Thank you so much yeah. for uh, chatting. Uh, good yeah. luck with your summer in Davis. Yeah, dude. Thank sure you. It'll be an interesting time. Uh, who knows what's going to happen at Central Park? And mm -hmm. uh, good luck with the future. Uh, of your I, I had a I had a plug actually. Like, I, oh. if you could help, if anyone wants to, like, I don't know, follow me on Instagram. I have a mm. close friends list on Instagram for my Instagram stories where I share a track every now and then, which is like something that I do like very sporadically but it's fun mm -hmm. and i like showing people music and i don't want to clog the, the people who don't want to see it on you know the regular mm -hmm. instagram stories so if anyone is interested just homies. follow me on instagram and send me a dm and i really like sharing a track every now and then as pretentious as that sounds right. you know it's fun yeah. and like if you can get into like more electronic stuff but it's all electronic music that i post there um yeah. other than that i did a links will be I did a mix box. recently yeah and recently i did a mix for kdvs uh which is on my soundcloud now which is just uh, Amar Bayani on SoundCloud. You find, hey, find there. I'll check it out. I'm gonna um, give it a listen. And, and that was this. that was done pr primarily with Black artists in it for the Black Tight. Lives Matter movement. And in the comments, there's a, a spreadsheet and a document with mm. all the resources and how you can help out and all of that stuff. So Sweet. you know, definitely check that out and check out the music as well because it's all link will be in the so. bio. There's going to be like 20 links. Just <laughs> it's, it's you're not doing enough, enough. okay? Even in the, like, it's like even in the DIY scene, it's yeah. like there's so much pressure just to like pay attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Luckily, everything. someone compiled everything into like one standard Google Doc, which has like a lot of like mm. really, really important resources, which I totally. think. So definitely check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're hoping for an abolished police by the soon TM. yeah let's see let's see Hopefully. and uh, uh we'll see what happens i guess anyways thank you all for listening have a wonderful rest of your day amar and thank you. goodbye <laughs> i'm still working on how to end these things all right um, take care man take care